Okay. Yep. I think uh, we can start. It's um, about two minutes in. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. So, yep, as you can see, uh, our speaker for the day is Clemens. So, he will be going through, um, I guess, just giving a overview of Web3. You know, we're going to learn more about Web3 by exploring examples of implementations and use cases across the ecosystem. So, without further ado, I'll pass the time over to Clemens. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Clemens Wan. I'm a solution architect at Consensus for almost five years now, and I work on a lot of DGEN stuff. So <laughs> looking forward to sharing all of this great material with you. Uh, before I start, there is a NavH resources, and I'll just share the link in the chat. This is for all of the recordings that we've had for last week, all of the bounties, if you want to see it, they're, they're the bounty specific ones are kind of in the this area and then you can see the hackathon recordings within there um, for each of them so this will also be recorded and i can share my slides as well because i put a lot of links in there okay so today we want to talk about the different use cases and trends behind web3 i'll i'll do a quick comparison to social networks to app stores and then i'll talk about being a, a contributor and how i stay up to date as always, and I did this two days ago for uh, the other workshop, I like to make a comparison. What we want to talk about today is not cryptocurrencies and speculation. There's a lot of news that covers money, crypto drama, price prediction, speculation. Uh, what we want to talk about is the opportunity around tech crypto. Tech crypto involves the use cases that make our lives easier. Technology is supposed to you know, do more with less. And it's not just using blockchains or distributed ledger, but also building a trusted network that you integrate with your applications and, and hopefully integrate with your everyday lives as well. So let, let's do the, the classic comparison. This has been done by everyone. So I'll just pull some slides. I personally love A16Z. They have a crypto division. This is from their 2023 state of crypto report. If you haven't seen it, it's also a good starting point. Uh, it shows here web one is the early days of the internet using static content, using websites. Everyone had a blog. They wanted to share the information that they had in their brain and kind of give it off to the world. Web two looked a lot more like user generated content on federated platforms. So creating social graphs with different posts that you have. So your Facebook, your, your different social media, e-commerce revolution, that's all part of web two. So anyone can publish that data, uh, basically being their own news agency if they wanted to. And then finally, Web3 is a trusted value exchange. There might be decentralized storage of data in there and processing. It uses tokens as a way to show ownership. And so you have the read, write, and own revolution of the internet. If you wanted to see this a little bit more simply, Web1 is the old days of username and password, which a lot of people still use. Web2 is federated logins because they're storing a lot more of your data and metadata, maybe even selling that. And then Web3 is bringing your own assets. So that's why you connect your wallet. And just to kind of bring that a little bit further, uh, what changes in the business model? And so Web2 versus Web3 is about centralization versus decentralization. Again, this is from A16Z. On the left side, it shows a standard Web2 tech stack, meaning a Web2 business will collect your user data, sell ads, and you know have their own types of metrics for growing. On the right side, you have public and verified secure networks. So you have this source of truth being the blockchain itself. And so what you're doing is you're connecting your wallet to assets that you already own. So the company and their actual uh, value proposition is not about selling your data. In fact, most of you know these, these Web3 dApps do not have a business model around advertising. What's important here is when venture capitalists value growth social media companies, they look at the users that come back to upload content, right? They're always getting the information through a single platform on the left over here because they want to build out their database. They want to show that their brand is strong. It's all about the stickiness of that brand and uh, identity. If you think about Web3, there really isn't a stickiness 
because you could build a new front end client to any piece of the data. So for example, if you take the lens protocol, that's kind of the decentralized version of a social network. It starts with the posts and your profile as NFTs. And so when you start from that far down, anyone can build a new front end for it and you can inherit all of the posts that you own, you know, from your wallet. So you're really just rendering assets, right? It's no longer the idea of, uh, I have to post directly to Instagram and then take that post and also post it to, uh, Facebook and then also post it to, you know, LinkedIn. And, and so the one to many still exists because there's a lot of networks, but it's not as uh, clear because it should be one digital asset to many platforms. Uh, this is a little bit more technical, but I think it, it's useful in case we have some developers here. It's a deeper dive into interacting with Web3. So everything is still through a browser. People think you know Web3 might have its own phone or something, and some of them do. The idea is that your wallet is your trusted model. You own your own assets, right? And so what's different is that the business logic, when you're writing all of the, you know, where do pieces go? What gets updated? All of that is in the protocol level. So a protocol level are smart contracts. They're publicly verifiable. You can look at them on a blockchain explorer. You know, you can review them. And your wallet is really the one that's reviewing all of the, for example, Lens Protocol, all of the posts, NFTs, all of your assets. And then the data is saved on this node distributed ledger. Right. Instead of having just one organization, it's really a lot of people doing different roles to come up with a trusted network. Some people may think this is great in theory, but how can users own their own data and then businesses succeed without advertising? Well, the truth is, you know, Web3 is already here. There's already developer, everyday users. It, it can show for itself that there's not just NFTs, there's DeFi, there's DAOs, there's tools that are helping these DAOs and, and, and protocols grow. I'm personally excited because the tools are the ones that are growing more quickly. So I see this in comparison to the early days of the internet when you people were writing HTML and CSS, and now people write in JavaScript and everything's kind of more JavaScript based. And we kind of went through different series of, of uh, of different types of languages. And I don't know if people used Adobe Flash at some point, but no longer <laughs> anymore. Uh, there's improvements to the browser and things like that. So I, I think there's a lot of room to grow, to optimize. And we're, we're seeing that with the different trends that I'm paying attention to. When you look at the history of building this technology, we've really seen an evolution of businesses and personas that are interested in the space. So it's no longer developers and venture capitalists. I think that today, especially with AI, the creator economy is really starting to boom uh, and it's not going away, right? There's NFTs, their integration with existing Web2 businesses that allows anyone to be able to use this technology without even thinking about what the technology does. Another way that I like to think about this is if you own your own company, which departments will be connecting to Web3? So who are you telling in your company to look at this material? I think the most basic one is marketing. A big part of the marketing budget can explore using NFTs and joining DAOs and working with these communities to grow the brand of your company. Uh, what's important to me is the cost of customer acquisition. That's still a valuable number to keep track of in Web3. A lot of people ignore it <laughs> for some reason, but uh, CAC costs are, are, are super important. I don't know why people, you know, throw away the old metrics, but they are they are there for a reason. Another is technology. Maybe on your website, you need to connect to the wallet to render different assets, maybe issue them through different blockchain networks. Uh, this might slightly augment your existing architecture. And then I think within progressive decentralization, uh, I'll talk more about that later, but uh, corporate finance, some of the allure of Web3 is thinking about tokens, right? I need a token so that I can support my project before I start building my project. The truth is that's not a good model because that looks a lot like your fundraising in order to support the project. 
if you look at the principles of progress progressive decentralization you actually want to have product market fit for your project before you even launch a token um, that's kind of the better way of doing it because it shows that you have earnestly built something out and you are just using the funds to help the utility and growth of that product so uh, this is especially true even even with like the grants model where you use your tokens to govern your grants uh, there's a lot of decentralization hand waving or lip service that people do to say hey i've included a layer of democratic voting but all of my team members own all the tokens right that's not that's not as good, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get there eventually. I, th I think it is a spectrum of decentralization. Uh, I like this slide because it summarizes the different, yes. Just to cut you off a bit, sorry, because I think I'm not the only one. When you move your mouse, I think it duplicates itself. So it's showing off on our screen is a lot of mouse. So maybe I think just for now, um, try not to move your mouse around because it's quite distracting. Nope. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah, my computer yeah, no wants to do an update. That's why it's so slow. I will <laughs> Thanks so much. To... Yeah, thank you. I forgot where I was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Web3 channels, tactics, strategies. This is a summary of uh, how you can use Web3 or people have used Web3 with different tokens and different community building pieces. So. Fungible tokens started with ICOs or initial coin offerings. They've evolved into more governance tokens. And that's, again, to be uh, as, not to be associated with securities categorization. You want to have utility behind it. You want to have significant uh, or sufficient decentralization. NFTs themselves provide a first gating access. So maybe you start a limited collection for a newsletter or uh, trying to create Kind of exclusivity maybe it's a subscription token or it's a long-term badge of some sort it, it could represent digital twins if you're building something with the, the real world DAOs themselves can represent a community of members sharing the same account address for their treasury right and so when you're for forming a DAO, you can join the DAO by committing different tokens or just being a member and voting as usual it's kind of like joining a country you, you want to vote on the different policies and how that DAO spends its funds uh, how it spends its taxes for example um, the voting helps with the capital formation and different allocations DeFi or decentralized finance is seen in the previous uh area as kind of an ecosystem of credit and debit so you're thinking about stable coins you're thinking about um, borrowing to trade so margin trading different staking and swapping. There's other patterns. I have a whole section on Web3 trends around DeFi. And finally, uh, you know, metaverse on the gaming side, we see interoperability coming together, you know, connecting identities, secondary markets of game item. That, that seems to be a, a major trend. And more recently, AI, uh, there's a lot of thought of how do I create AI agents? And with those AI agents, how do I access them with either recording the chain of calls or making sure that the data that they're using is uh, the licensing is available as well. If you want to learn more about the tech stack, uh, there's an article that we wrote on the Infura blog. It covers the Web3 tech stack. There's a, a link here. If you're still new to all of these, feel free to, and I'll share that here. I think, was this written by Clarissa, who's up next to speak? Probably. Very cool. Okay, uh, let's go to the next section. We have, where are we today? And I'll, I'll address the questions a little bit later only because I, I can't really see them. Today we have a lot of network options and people always ask like, why are you using Ethereum? I mean, we're not always using Ethereum. It is the idea it's the security that and the distribution of tokens and kind of the EVM itself that makes it a good community. Uh, if you just look at people, you know, improving solidity, for example, that is a whole ecosystem of itself. I think the success and adoption is similar to a new social media platform. Let's say it's like threads, you know, made by, by Meta as a competitor, Twitter. It's not always about the features. 
it's actually more about the onboarding and the bridging of existing users. And so if all of Web3 are these kind of blockchain addresses and wallets, they're all kind of starting from either Bitcoin or either Ethereum, right? And then from there, they start you know, their first journey through the frontier of Ethereum. And so you, you usually have a lot more uh, wallets and, and users on Ethereum, and then they start exploring bridging into other networks. And so that as a source, it just makes sense to have this be a successful network. If Ethereum falls down, I would say other networks would likely fall down as well, because you need that uh, level of distribution, security, and, and those assets themselves for a successful launch. Uh, luckily, Ethereum has been around since you know 2015. It's provided the ecosystem. There's a foundation that forwards the protocol. A lot of people are supportive. They don't all just come from one company. Uh, Vitalik can't just you know remove your transactions from the ledger, right? It's it's decentralized. Under the community, you do have uh, you know standards and software clients. Um, so it runs the same standard, and therefore. You can have different languages write that piece of software. For DeFi, we have liquidity and stable coins. Uh, it's, it's being deployed. And in, across all the assets, we connect to different crypto market infrastructure and, and kind of the real world fiat piece as well. And so it's a, it's a vibrant community. And when I'm looking to deploy to a network, I always look for uh, what, what are these factors that make me want to deploy to one network versus another? It's like choosing iOS versus Android, right? Do I want a, an iOS application or an Android? I ideally want both and many, but uh, you may need to choose the one that you deploy to first. And so that could depend on how many of those tokens you have. Maybe it depends on the connections you have. Maybe you're, you're applying to grants or something similar to that. It's important to note that we are not just building a new coding language and a new tech stack. Like it's not just Node.js, right? It, this is a full end-to-end -end universe of technologies that builds on top of each other. Uh, there is a true decentralized approach to improving the software in this open source ethos. It's, it's again, not just deployment in silo by a single company, but it's really the strength of innovation that I've seen through the democratization of kind of this ecosystem. Like anybody can just go in and com contribute to the community. Uh, this is a slide I created to address one of the early stage questions. I still think it's important here is it's for enterprises. So I started this space back in 2014, 2015. I was building for a financial institution um, and we were building blockchains directly for enterprise use cases. And they really wanted to create this intranet out of an internet type of technology, right? So I wanted an internal wiki because we wanted to say the permissioned private blockchains could allow us to use the properties of a blockchain, meaning, you know, there's a link there to all the transactions, the transactions are saved, there's immutability, right? Uh, but the early uh, analysis was that we could not scale uh, a scalability so any type of performance that you needed for enterprise level or privacy concerns in a public space and so we found that you know using public infrastructure today is actually lower the cost of development one of the big barriers for enterprises was actually funding the creation and ceremonies for running a blockchain itself you sufficiently need to decentralize the infrastructure which is what we've done with a token that represents the incentive model for running all of these different pieces. So miners get paid for being a staker, right? You know, in the old days, it was miners and proof of work, but you are running different pieces, but you also get compensated by being a part of the network. And I think that permissioned networks have forgotten that or have not been successful in launching because they haven't built out an incentive layer outside of Hey, we're in a joint venture and we have like a tech company that that's runs the the permission network um, i think the ecosystem follows a lot of composability and open source innovation which is why it's so successful okay my next series of slides are <clears throat> actually something that i haven't changed in three years four years which is kind of interesting uh what are the major use cases in web3 and and because i haven't changed them it's not because the use cases haven't changed is because, um, you know, these are generic enough areas that people have been continuing to find you know, new ways to improve it that 
you know, existing Web2 companies have been looking at it. So you have payments and money, you have decentralized finance and DAOs and communities, and then you have enterprise adoption with digital assets. There, there, there's kind of more nuanced things that are happening, but more or less things are the same. So where do blockchain networks fit in for payments? In traditional financial services, if you think about your bank, the interface for users is likely through a credit card or debit card, right? And so these cards are processing your payments, and but at the end of the day, the banks still have the funds. And the reason for this, and people have been thinking like, well, why doesn't the central bank, the Fed, have accounts? And then those accounts can then just trade with each other and we can work directly with the Fed. That would be way too much overhead. There would be customer support. You would have to do KYC on everybody. That's the reason why we have so many different banks and credit unions on the side is because the user experience is better. It wasn't all first digital, right? And banks can do a lot of things with their funds, right? They can trade it. They can, you know, do anything they want with with the money within kind of the the rules of of the the you know financial ecosystem. In decentralized finance. The users are interacting with each other through the wallets, and then the wallets equally can send transactions to any blockchain network wherever it sits, and then your balance is based on that single shared ledger. And so when we pitch this for central bank digital currency, they know exactly what we're talking about. And I have a, a slide here that kind of clarifies it. So on the left side, uh, and usually the added animations, but I guess they get removed. Um, but on the left, uh, sorry, <laughs> the, uh, the cursor, I'm so used to using it. So on the left side, you have um, the current banking ecosystem, which is you are a merchant, right? You're selling goods at your store. Um, you want to purchase from a merchant. Maybe you have a credit card system using a point of sale system. Uh, MasterCard, for example, it's optimized for around 7,000 transactions per second. And when you settle, you are using the different banks that have balances with each other. And they either use something called real-time gross settlement, RTGS, or large value transfer settlement, LVTS. And so if you're, you're looking at the user experience on the right side, what we've changed is that instead of having, uh, instead of having you know, these credit cards, and maybe credit cards still exist, but use different rails on the back end, you have a new e-wallet type of product that provides the customers with a solution that implements with the merchants. And so the advantage here is that the digital currency settlement ledger is a replacement for the inefficiencies in the banking technology infrastructure. Because it's been around for a while, you just have a lot of like silly string, you know, thousands and thousands of vendors per bank, and then every bank settles in different ways, and it's just super inefficient. So I think the, the, the key here is like, why don't we just do this immediately? And uh, I like to compare this to the adoption of electric vehicles for the past, you know, 20 years, right? 15, 20 years. Um, we will still have <clears throat> the options to pay with cash and card, but the way that we view the information could be through blockchain-based, you know, mobile wallets, right? And so electric vehicles took a long time to adopt because oil companies wanted to continue, you know, making money. <laughs> I'm selling. <clears throat> Sorry about that. They, they want to continue. Maybe the oil companies are, are cursing me. <laughs> they want to continue making money. And so uh, selling electric vehicles is, is very difficult and, and sees it as a threat to them. And so they're obviously lobbying. They have vested interest in maintaining their hold on the economy. And I think the same is for, for bank money, right? If, if you take out all the IT systems or reduce half the IT spending across banks, then a lot of people lose jobs or you know, that there is a significant amount of uh, pain in the industry for, for this new revolution. The same thing for AI, right? People are like, oh, well, I don't need this particular writer uh, because I have AI to do the writing on my behalf. And I, I think that things can exist in parallel and, and uh, this will likely happen much slower uh, overall. But we will have kind of these ecosystems that still use digital currencies as an option for payment, and they will be embedded in almost everything that we do, right? People will have wallets and people will use them. Related to finance, um, this was a slide that we used in 2019, 
uh, for the SWIFT conference, Cybos, I think it was based out of Australia at that time. The major use case here attracts companies because people want a transaction fee business model, right? Everybody wants to own the product. Everybody wants more money to flow through the product. Um, the economy cares very deeply about funds and how they're managed in their life cycle. And this is just to show what is traditional finance breaking down and how our companies and especially, you know, new companies building on top of it. So for example, Facebook Messenger started off with just communication and identity of the people that you would speak with. And then it layers on things like payments. So you can send funds between those identities and it might look a lot like Venmo. And then you can start accruing your savings, like creating a credit card, gaining points on those credit card. Venmo has a credit card where you can buy crypto uh, with your points that are gained. There's also lending that's available. Um, eventually, you can maybe use your existing collateral of crypto to lend it to others. You can connect to markets to trade or invest. And so some companies like Revolut um, have, have done this on the other side. I think the best example that I've seen, if you look at the feature history of Robinhood, it started off as an exchange. It expanded into, you know, cryptocurrency markets. It launched more and more features that covered all these areas. Uh, you are allowed to do savings. It has a percent APY of, of like 5.4.5% 4 .5 right now. There's tiered access to it. There's long-term investments. They have 401k. And so if you think about the full spectrum of how you use your money, uh, these Web2 companies, Silicon Valley companies are, are building towards that. And eventually, I wouldn't be surprised if they say, well, add other friends that are trading and trade with your other friends, right? That would complete on the left side of the, the area. So I mentioned, I mentioned this because when we look at DeFi, we also want to think about uh, what the opportunities are for building out the same type of financial ecosystem, but in the decentralized Web3 space. And so this diagram was shared by the St. Louis Fed in February of 2021. And this basically shows uh, what's called the FAT protocol thesis. FAT protocol being that a lot more of this open source data and business logic is stored on the bottom part, on the protocol level. So for example, if I'm starting from scratch and I wanted to build you know, some type of you know, shopping, e-shopping commerce, e-commerce shopping platform, uh, instead of using PayPal, maybe I'll use uh, DeFi, right? What if I wanted people to be able to pay with cryptocurrencies? Well, there's a lot of different uh, connections that you can make. It's, it's in, the, in the traditional world, that would be a company. In the decentralized world, that's just a series of smart contracts. That's just a series of APIs that can be hosted and anyone can call them. And so I think that's the power here is you have all of these different layers that provide different functions and your web3 company can be focused on specific protocols or or forking protocols to improve them so for example the early days of portfolios right portfolio of assets and the percent allocation of those portfolios the idea was to have a portfolio manager that only focuses on their their uh, distribution and not focused on onboarding and so with this technology, with the FAT protocol, that's kind of what you're able to do. You can focus on building the application rather than building the back end and the, the different endpoints. Different wallets, such as MetaMask, have thought about where your funds go and how uh, these pieces can be connected to. So it's starting your own profile, having a portfolio of assets that you can view on-ramping your assets from USD to uh, USDC or other tokens, swapping them between different aggregator of different, you know, DEXs out there, decentralized exchanges, thinking about indexes, uh, thinking about the security level of the token, funds, uh, synthetics, which mimic the real world um, stock market, NFTs, lending, borrowings. All these are kind of things that already exist within DeFi and through 2018 until today, you, you've seen kind of phases of growing out uh, all of this functionality in wallets, but also in throughout the ecosystem, right? Everybody wants to have uh, a piece of uh, financial services because it's, it's beneficial, right? There's a lot of value being transferred and therefore financial services make sense as a use case. When you put it all together, this is kind of 
called money Legos, but I see them as different layers. On the bottom layer, you have ETH, which I believe is a commodity because it's, it's kind of like having oil where you need to use the oil to enable other applications. You need to use gas to send your transactions. And the more complex your smart contracts are, the more gas you need to use, right? And you have to purchase gas to pay for it. On top of that, you have uh, the building of stable coins. So MakerDAO is a decentralized version of a stable coin. So instead of using, you know, like Tether or uh, USDC Circle, right, you're using a contract that keeps track of the collateral so you can borrow on top of it. Uh, and that's how you kind of create this value, right? You're always borrowing and lending. That's kind of the, the beauty of economics. And so what was you know, recreated from the early days of ICOs was, hey, I don't just have volatile tokens. I have stable tokens that reflect USD. And then I can also borrow on top of them. So let's build a bunch of very cool DeFi apps. And the things that you can do that you can't do in the real world, for example, uh, like a lossless lottery within pool together, the idea is that people are able to uh, contribute through transactions to a lottery smart contract. And then that smart contract takes all of those funds and puts them into an interest earning contract. And at the end of the month, a winner is chosen and they receive the interest payment only minus a fee. And then everybody else gets their money back. And so imagine doing that in real world today, you know, going to a lottery. Now there's lottery apps where you can, you can do that, I believe like it's like a billion dollars right now for the, the mega millions or something, but you, imagine them giving your money back, uh, and then just using the funds for, you know, accruing interest until the winner has earned. Uh, this that takes a lot more technology. This is just a few transactions, and it's written within a smart contract. Uh, DeFi has been around, and there are use cases within, you know, regular finance that has been built by a lot of different companies. And so this is just to show. I believe I drew this around 2018, 2019. And so again, it's, it's already here. It's very interesting. I, I kind of personally love this space and continue to follow uh, new patterns that arrive. This is another slide from that uh, financial services conference that I went to. The web two companies innovated by taking advantage of a new combination of technologies. So for example, streaming services for Netflix, right? Matching services for transportation and Uber. The business model itself doesn't work when you apply it with old technology. And so the, the tagline here is you cannot build a Spotify of CD-ROMs, right? And we think that, and we have thought this for a long time, that Ethereum and other blockchain networks provide the future of finance to replace legacy infrastructure. Um, at this conference, people asked me, I was like, what's the difference between DeFi and just like open banking APIs? The open banking API that this is like a, you know, worldwide thing that every bank should have open APIs where through authentication, you should be able to use kind of this programming to control your funds or to, to participate in uh, different types of savings accounts. That is completely different because banks are tapping into this back office special pot of better interest rates and they're kind of cheating the system, right? They have, everything is cheaper for a bank when they're purchasing it. Uh, and we get kind of the more expensive inflated things. Uh, and so, you know, when you think about finance and DeFi, DeFi means that you can directly interact with the base rates for everything. So there's no, um, you know, obfuscation of pricing, right? One bank is, is going to charge something different, but that's because they have different margins. And so that leads to this slide. Um, I said technology is to do more with less. And, and so what we want to do and what this revolution does is instead of having the cost of operations always centralized and rebuilt by every single bank out there where you know your infrastructure is probably half of your cost, if not more, the CFI DeFi model is to leverage these nonprofit types of infrastructure pieces so that you can focus directly on building your for-profit type of user segments. And so um, I wrote this article about bringing costs to zero. And so when you bring a cost to zero, such as like sending messages between people, it used to be using, you know, mail and horses and whatnot to, to send your message to another person. We have 
email now so you, or, and messaging, so you don't need to do that. That has created new opportunities. I think the issuance of digital assets, if you look at it from a bank side, if I wanted to get a loan for my mortgage in order to buy a house, all of that is still legal base. It's still going through multiple banks and agents. And then, you know, the, your delivery versus payment is still, hey, I got your money in this bank from like an email where you sent a bunch of numbers that represent your bank account. Like all of that in the digital asset space of blockchain can be done with single transactions, right? You can do delivery versus payment through these transactions uh, without intermediaries. And so the cost of creating an NFT is zero, pretty much. It should be zero. Uh, it's just the gas cost of, of using the network. And I think that, that that's important to think about. It's like, where is the manufacturing cost of this going? How can I reduce the time to market? How can I reduce the number of intermediaries? I'm still good on time. That's great. Uh, another popular thing is non-fungible tokens or NFTs. The, for people who don't know, NFTs just means that it's a token with a single owner. So the starting point of the NFT was the collectible, similar to a baseball card, right? Uh, and, and so the value is based on who's trading it. So how much is this baseball card worth? Well, how unique is it? It's pretty unique. And then, you know, how popular was the player behind it? And so NFTs growing out of those use cases uh, evolved into more identity. So maybe I receive an NFT for attending an event or joining a particular exclusive club. And maybe the NFT, like the Board Ape Yacht Club NFT, has a collection of 10,000 Board Apes, and that's it. And so people that buy the NFT uh, and celebrities that might own it may also be popular for other people to purchase because then you're kind of in the same Discord with famous people or you're joining exclusive you know, types of parties where your Board Ape can be used as a identifier of who you are so that you can join that party. Uh, same for participation, you know, we have proof of attendance protocol, POAPs, and you can think of that as a newsletter, right? I've a, I've joined this particular event, maybe there's a lot of POAPs out there, and I want to contact everybody that has my POAP for a follow-up. So they've essentially physically scanned the QR code, has the NFT, and now they're part of a subscription service. Um, and then... Lastly, digital twins, I feel like um, this is pretty interesting as well. There was a project uh, with Damien Hurst that we helped launch called the Currency Project. He drew 10,000 pieces of artwork and minted 10,000 NFTs for his collectors and sold them. And then uh, there was a point where he asked, do I burn the physical or the digital art piece? I thought that was super interesting. He asked everybody that owned the NFT what they wanted to do, if they wanted to like physically receive the artwork that he had painted or burn it. And he wound up burning 4,000 of his pieces of artwork and keeping the NFT versions. And so people believe more in the NFT and the kind of the digital representation, as well as the video and kind of him showing each artwork and then saying, well, this is being burnt. I mean, that, that's all the package behind uh, this particular asset. This is just an attempt uh, from my side because I like drawing boxes and diagrams. This is what I do all day. Uh, thinking about a standard NFT sale ecosystem. And so I'm thinking about this as if you are a user and an agent and uh, you have creators and buyers as well, the agent is the person in the middle. This is like your Sotheby's or Christie's trying to sell all of these things, trying to, to get the best price. Maybe there's an auction involved. So there's kind of a bidding against each other. Um, I think art curators are thinking about how they are helping connect the customers to the artwork network. To facilitate the trading on the bottom, we have all these platforms and networks and you have the hosting of the digital asset that can be verified by everyone. And then also built-in payments, right? I, I believe um, there was a sale within Sotheby's where it accepted ETH as a way to pay for your particular NFT or your particular um, asset, which I think is really cool. Um, the platform itself is helping with the integration to these minting services, to these marketplaces for secondary sales. And, and I think that, you know, the scarcity of time for here is pretty important. You want that bidding war. And ultimately, we want to manifest, you know, some type of long-term fan engagement, 
right? So if I'm a fan and I'm connected to a brand, I want to be a long-term fan. I want to show off that I'm a fan. So you, you may have an NFT that says you're a lifelong subscriber or you're an early contributor to a SaaS product that's being released. So where is this today? For market adoption, we've seen NFTs as an easy gateway from these large companies to engage with their customers. They're building, building out their existing user interfaces to be wallets and rendering all these assets. I, I think Starbucks has one of the best NFT loyalty programs out there. It's really just a badge because it's with the, within the same ecosystem, but they can always turn on the additional type of distribution networks out there. So. There's a lot of this, I believe even like Burning Man has NFTs or was it Coachella? Coachella has NFTs for like lifelong memberships uh, and, and different things like that for exclusivity. Um, so what are examples of successful collectible launches? I, I think that um, this is an important reflection Right, the NFT team has done a lot of work here. So Consensus has an NFT team. The tired version of this are PFPs, or kind of por portfolio pictures that are just NFTs. Right, there's a lot of FOMO. People try to come up with new traits, um, reduce the supply, change it, have, have different pricing and roadmap, and like evolutions of PFPs. There, there were first just allow lists, which mean there's a subset of people that can access it. And then I think um, eventually there were selling auctions. Like for example, you can airdrop an NFT to a famous, you know, Twitter Twitter person with a lot of followers, like influencers with followers. And then you say, well, we started an NFT collection, and one of them's owned by Shaq or something like that. And then hey, let, let's sell more NFTs off of it. And that that hasn't seemed to work because people who have those NFTs obviously don't want to sell it; they want to increase the price. But eventually, when they do sell, it kind of causes an avalanche of sell selling sell pressure on top of it. What we want to see is more of the brand inclusion. So you have more complexity with uh, thinking about how community and creators can use their revenue that they gain to give back. There's more emotional ownership because these brands have been around for a long time. Uh, there's more on-chain interaction with, you know, Web2 companies that already have kind of all of these different um, logins already. And I think that, that that will be a big part of the adoption for NFTs. Last few slides here for the Web Trends section. Uh, when I recommend this to, to different groups and conferences that I speak at, I always say, do not reinvent the wheel, just drive innovation towards what has been experimented with. So if you look at the history of use cases, uh, I mentioned, you know, I started in financial services. We looked at global trade. We looked at liquid assets, payments, tokenization from 2016 onward, central bank digital currencies. We're pretty thorough with what we covered, but none of them gained enough traction because they were uh, worried about launching those tokens and assets onto public networks. And I think that now the, there's a lot more focus on building layer twos and building these protocols. Uh, but that's because creators are thinking about how they can use them more interesting, uh, kind, of, kind of in more interesting ways. And so there's a lot more focus, and this is the, the, the trend since last year, is focusing on building, building better tools, building better protocols, expanding, and then thinking about how Web2 companies can uh, use the regular, their, their regular users, their signups to, to join kind of either the metaverse or you know, the, the, the budding technology. Um, there's no shortage of topics. I've, I've done this for a long time, thought about all these topics. I think about them every day. The most popular ones are in green right now. So new DeFi patterns, uh, very, very interesting ways to engage different liquidity providers, to engage uh, different other protocols and, and kind of create new flywheel cycles and economic cycles out there. Following layer one of Ethereum is a big hobby of mine too. So attending uh, different types of open Ethereum engineering um, meetups out there, all of them are recorded and, and can be joined. They're, they're looking at the research team and what they're building together, the specs that are launched. Layer two is also popular. So Consensus just launched our, our Linea layer two uh, ZK rollup blockchain, which is super exciting. I believe 
today or yesterday was the mainnet launch. Uh, I'm also looking at regulations because it's important. Maybe you have to move out of the country, uh, who knows? <laughs> and then also DAOs and legal entities. What, what are the regulations that help with creating DAOs so that they can be kind of this extension of your uh, company so that your company does not need to, you know, for those who, who, who have companies or have, have participated in them from the accounting side, you have to do a lot of secretary work. And I feel like the DAO meetings and actions can actually be very, very good for um, keeping track of your you know, membership. It's kind of like having a website. If you have a website uh, that's associated with your with your uh, incorporated company, you may also have DAOs in the future that are, are associated to it that that acts as your you know crypto bank account for it. So I'm looking forward to a lot of that and, and how it manifests. The last section here is just a day in the life, like how do you become a Web3 contributor? Hopefully it's it's useful. Uh, again, I'll share the slides with the links. First thing for me is to focus on the tech, not the casino. Uh, read very deliberately because people will try to make you buy different tokens. And that's not what it's about. I mean, definitely purchase tokens if you think that the project is interesting. But it's the same as, as the investment landscape out there, right? People will try to have people that have you know, in their, their mid forties that have a lot of money that say like, oh, I want to invest in the space. And then they, they kind of just give away their money and don't know where the returns are, right? <laughs> Tends to happen quite a bit um, for those that are just new to being, you know, some type of uh, early stage investor. Uh, I mentioned the trends before for the previous one, but more specific to the consensus products that we have wallets, we have a gateway, we have a network. And so what I'm interested in on the wallet side is more account features. So account abstraction, which is ERC 4337 is, is, you know, going to be implemented. There's already a lot of really, really great use cases out there to be a tagline is to get billions on board. And so uh, high level, it is a smart contract wallet rather than a, a separate account wallet. And so there's more controls that you can do and you can also create them in parallel and, and they're all on chain. So it's easier to manage. There's also snaps within MetaMask and we're excited for the snap store that might come out in the near future, right? All of these are building out an app store so that developers can work together without rebuilding new wallets, for example. On the gateway side, it's about community growth, but also how do you make developing easier? Um, there's a, another buzzword here, stakeholder capitalism. So capitalism in general is just participating in our economy where we, we, we hope that, you know, private companies can disrupt bigger companies by having the opportunity of the new technology, but also again, like starting very scrappy building fast and stakeholder capitalism means you, you are participating and owning some of these, uh, early stage companies or kind of even larger companies by. Uh, participating early by owning a piece of that, um, by owning a piece of that company. So uh, the other thing here is Linea and the higher transaction, lower fees. There's uh, actions happening on layer one that's helping, such as proto dank sharding, that's ERC 4844, as well as uh, maximal extractable value. There's a lot to think about there. And if you can nerd out, feel free to, to read through um, different types of uh, review calls that are that are being released. There's a lot of notes. What do I pay attention to? If you're curious, this is a I created a separate email address long time ago that covers all of these. I join a lot of newsletters. It's just always flooded with pretty much the same type of headlines. But uh, these are the ones that I think have unique views. For example, Week in Ethereum news includes a lot of dev work that happens, a lot of summaries. So I like to read that uh, once a week. ETH Hub from, by Susano. I mean, there's there's a few of these that, that are consistently very, very good. Masari and The Block have longer reports that I like to subscribe and read. Um, different DAOs like Bankless DAO, Developer DAO, Village DAO, which is launching shortly as well. Um, all of this is, is pretty good to, to follow and uh, once you're in the ecosystem, it's kind of like joining a subreddit to, you know, anybody can, can read it, anybody can follow it, and you can be as engaged as you'd like. For me, the best way to 
uh, get involved in projects is by meeting in real life. So I follow ETH Global. There's a lot of companies that have spreadsheets out there that are public that you can also follow. I can, I can share a few links to those. Uh, and you can just see where either specific companies are there or just looking at, uh, right now ETH CC is happening or ETH, ETH Paris is happening right now, ETH Global Paris. So a lot of exciting things. And uh, there's also local meetups that you can join. I know I know people in major cities are are doing meetups on a weekly basis. So there, there's a lot out there. My last slide here is thinking about the creation of content. Uh, I like to tell people to focus on their superpower and then find who will care about the content you create. And so I, I do this for my social media posts as well. It's it's sometimes I just you know scream into the void, but it's always good to leverage what your content does and have people that appreciate it. So the leftmost side is is kind of non-technical roles or things that you can do deliverables as either a project manager or a community member. I think project management is is highly underrated in this space. A lot of people think of oh let's just build a project and and we'll have a bunch of devs on it. You know, devs need guidance, right? They need to be told that there are only a subset of activities that you need to focus on. Um, don't try to build everything at once, try to build it deliberately. They do very well with project summaries, right? A project manager helping with leading those meetings, with uh, allocating resources, with creating user stories, all of that interesting stuff that makes the momentum of a project complete is, is really key to any any industry, right? You need project managers and you need that community to feel involved and to continue to be involved. On the marketing side, uh, the brand of your particular company, you can write blogs, you can you know, make memes, you can make videos, whatever you're comfortable doing, you can make kind of promo videos uh, and you can get paid to do it, right? The, all of these protocols have some type of grant or fund or DAO that will allocate funds to you to, um, you know, do your particular project and pay you accordingly. At least the good ones do. So if, if they're not paying you for those projects, then uh, don't do them. <laughs> Just say like, hey, I need about $1,000 to do this marketing well, uh, and I want to create this video on your behalf. And, and yeah, it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one bid um, for that material. Uh, a little bit more technical is product management and design. So if you're a UI UX designer, then definitely help out because there are projects that have very poor UI UX design. If you have a good understanding of the ecosystem and you're a product person, uh, there's no shortage of things that you could write or to help propel the ecosystem as a thought leader, different types of requirements, competitor analysis and market insights. That's what I like to do. That That is a super important piece of this because there's just so many things happening in the market that uh, definitely pay attention to what other competitors are doing and how you compare to them and make sure that what you're building is unique and you're not reinventing the wheel. And then developers come in different flavors too. It's not just all full stack. You have people that are focused on front ends, people that are much more focused on smart contract development. Uh, maybe you're as, as a low level as auditing the contracts for security bugs or maybe integrations and APIs to existing um, web two services or bootstrap deployment of your, of your tokens, uh, of, of your smart contracts to a network. I mean, that, that's also important for a playbook. And I, I think that what this means is that you can be as non-technical or technical as you want, and there's a place for you in any industry, but especially for web three, because it's so community based. So, uh, to end this, choose your superpower and share it with the communities that care. I think that's the most important part here. Okay, uh, I said a lot. There's probably some questions. Let me see. Any questions that stand out? Yeah, I think there's yeah, one question one. by Vivek. Um, so the question is, how is Web3 fully decentralized as most of Layer one is managed or controlled by a few companies like Ethereum. So isn't that being centralized? So yeah, that's his question. Yeah, so decentralization is actually much more nuanced. The, the idea, and there's like a technical decentralization, which is if the founding members of the building of your software disappear, 
will the technology still exist? So if all of the Ethereum Foundation or, or Vitalik and kind of all those people that, that started the network leave, then technically the network can still run because they don't run all of the services. And so decentralization for technical means that the roadmap, the research, the, the, the people that are contributing to it does not have a single point of failure. Um, the economic version of that is there is no single whale that can crash the entire network. Uh, and so economics for the tokens that are involved, the NFTs are involved, right? There could be starting founding members that help with building it out, but eventually they want to distribute it as much as possible. So they are not the only ones controlling it. Um, there's also legal decentralization meaning that uh, who has insider information about this token or company that can trade on top of it. And so legal decentralization is another spectrum of um, how, how transparent is the governance and voting and evolution of this particular project. So I, I think that that's kind of the best way to, to form, formulate kind of this uh, spectrum of decentralization. I think Ethereum is significantly decentralized. It, it, the tokens that are being used are much more for security than they are for, I mean, they, they are also for fundraising, I would say, but uh, that's kind of the, the special uh, piece of having the value of the token also be used as the value of the ecosystem. Is there going to be a diversity in the winning project selection? Yes, we're going to have all of these bounties that are involved here. We'll try not to overlap too much. Any other questions that you saw? I'm just kind of reading back words. I think that's all. And I think we're right on time, yeah. two minutes left. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Clemens, for that very insightful session. So um, yeah, diving into the different buckets that make up Web3 from DeFi, um, NFTs, DAOs, um, and even providing advice to help um, those who are new to the space navigate their way around. I personally took a screenshot of that slide where you fleshed out all the platforms and resources and like newsletters that can help, you know, some someone who's new, stay up to date with um, this ever evolving space. So um, for those who see saw slides that were, you know, they caught your eye, don't worry, the recording of this workshop will be available on your builder's guide shortly um, tomorrow. Um, so yeah, keep a lookout for that. We'll park it um, under the resources page.